Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Friederike Range. Friederike is uh, from northern Germany, and she did her degree in biology in Germany before going to do her PhD with uh, Robert Seyfarth and Dorothy Cheney. It was actually at Penn University in the U.S., but she spent most of her time in Africa studying mangabey monkeys. She moved to Vienna in 2004, where she first started the Clever Dog Lab, a canine cognition lab, and then she went on to what you're going to hear about today, a very bold and ambitious move to create the Wolf Science Center, where dogs and wolves are raised under the same conditions so that we can really understand to what extent is their cognition genetically versus environmentally determined. And for that, she got an ERC grant, and so please join me in welcoming Professor Friederike Range. Can you hear me already? Yeah. Thank you very much, Tecamsa, for this really nice mm -hmm. introduction. I'm very honored to be here today and give this opening lecture uh, to you in the room here and to all these people who join us through the internet from all over the world. So it's really an honor for you, for me. It's really, I'm really happy about it. And I hope you're going to enjoy uh, the talk that I'm going to give you about the effects of domestication on the dog-human interactions. So, if you think about dogs, what you have in mind usually is uh, your pet dog, right? The dog that sits with you on the sofa, the dog that is really smart, cooperating with you, coordinating the actions with you, doing things together. Uh, they help us rescuing people, they help us guarding our livestock, so they are really together and really helpful and they are fantastic, right? Uh, so they are our best friends, but the question is really, how did we get there? And the idea is that this was an adaptation to the human environment, that, uh, so a domestication pro process through which the wolf became the dog. And there are actually two important questions that come with that, and one is which traits actually changed during this domestication process, and what were actually the selection pressures that led to these changes. And here we can go back to the history, namely Darwin already realized that there are certain traits that have all domesticates in common. So it doesn't matter if you talk about guinea pigs or domesticated foxes, chicken or rats, they all have some things in common or some of these things, which is a change in the crane morphology compared to their wild forms, floppy ears, smaller teeth, the coat color very often changes, so you, you get these white spots. They are more docile, their brain size usually gets smaller, they are, the hormone levels change, and there's also a change in the mating season, namely that the domesticated animals actually have more often, uh, or more frequent mating cycles. And all these um, suit of traits are actually often referred to as a domestication syndrome. And then there was this famous uh, Russian genetist, Dmitry Belev, and he thought that, okay, these changes actually come about by selecting for tameness, so selecting animals against fear and aggression. And he went about and uh, worked on a fur farm where they selected foxes, so these fur foxes, for uh, reduced fear against the human hand. So if they stuck their hand into the cage and they only bred those animals that were actually not afraid of this hand and weren't aggressive toward the hand. And what he found is that there were uh, correlates uh, of the selection, namely changes in morphology and physiology, reproduction, developmental speed, but also other behaviors. And so this is really important because it shows us that there's actually a causal relationship between selection on tameness and actually these syndrome traits. And the idea is that there's actually, uh, the, the underlying mechanism is our changes during the development of the neural crust cells. So, coming back to the wolf dogs. So does the selection for tameness really explain the wolf dog differences that we see in the animals when we compare them today? And especially in interaction with humans. 
Before we get into the research, though, we have to think about really what do we compare? Which dogs do we compare with the wolves? And here it's really important because the last years of uh, research from geneticists really gave us a much better insight over the domestication process. And what becomes clear here, what you see on the slides, is that actually there was first a domestication process with a... So I cannot really... Uh, see that? So there's a first domestication process where it's really a um, bottleneck, and then there's another bottleneck, but that's much, much later, and this is then actually the breed formation, where we selected then for very specific traits in a very few animals. So there's a very strong selection pressure. And so actually to understand domestication, actually these village dogs that are living out there that have not been selected for these very specific traits might actually be the much better model to understand domestication. And this is really important. And actually these village dogs, they have a much higher genetic diversity than the breed dogs. So it really should be that model that we compare to the wolves and not purebred dogs. Another aspect that's important when we think about comparing wolves and dogs is really that we have to neutralize the environment. Because these animals that are sitting on our couch, so the pet dogs, but also the free-ranging dogs, of course, have a lot of experiences with humans. So they, they are socialized with humans in, the, uh, in pet dogs, but also the free-ranging dogs, they, they live on human refuse, right? So they are close to humans all the time. Whereas Oops, sorry. Whereas wolves, actually, if you have them in enclosures or even in the wild, of course, they don't really have this exposure, exposure to humans. So we really have to neutralize the experience and the environment to really understand what happened during domestication to be sure that these differences that we see are through um, genetic differences and not through experience. So to do that, um, Kurt Kotrischal, Shufi Viran and myself, we set up the Wolf Science Center, where we actually compare wolves and mongrels uh, to each other. And these animals are hand-raised to lose their fear of humans, and then they are kept in conspecific packs so that we can really not just look at the human-animal interactions, but we can also look at the animal-animal interactions, which is, which is important because this is the basis really for their behavior. Um, and importantly, we really have mongrels, and these mongrels are genetically similar to uh, free-ranging dog populations. So these are not purebred dogs. So coming back to our hypothesis. So basically, one of the major hypotheses in the last few uh, years concerning domestication is the emotional reactivity hypothesis. And this is actually largely based on Balayev's idea namely that there was selection for, uh, against fear and aggression, and that really resulted in a higher tolerance and cooperativeness and communication in the dogs compared to the wolves. So based on that, we would actually expect that dogs are a lot less fearful and aggressive than wolves, and that they are also more co cooperative. And... Um, Actually, the idea that this uh, reduced fear and aggression is mediated through changes in the HPA axis. So based on this, we would also expect that there is a decrease in glucocorticoid levels in dogs compared to wolves. So let's see if that is true. So let's start with fear and aggression. Fear, yes. Wolves require intensive socialization with humans to lose the fear of the human and to really build up a close relationship with, these, uh, with humans. And also this relationship is not easily generalized to other people, so to strangers. So we know that from our own studies, but also other researchers have found that. So it's certainly true that wolves are very much afraid of humans. They're also afraid of novel objects and novel environments. But here already it becomes interesting because while wolves are more scared of these novel objects and environments, they are also more explorative. So once they uh, get over their fear, they actually spend a lot of time investigating these objects and trying to figure out what's going on with them. Whereas the dogs, just, they go there, but they're not really interested in it. 
Uh, also, the glucocorticoid levels really were interesting to look at. So we had two studies looking at that, one using urine collection, and there we actually found that the dogs had higher glucocorticoid levels than the wolves. So just the opposite from what we expected. Uh, and then we ran a study where it was about interactions with humans. So basically it was a training interaction where the animals had to pay attention to the human who told them then what to do, what commands to follow. And we collected the saliva before and after this interaction. And again we found that uh, the glucocorticoid levels were lower in the dogs, uh, in the wolves than the dogs. And actually, the interaction with the human reduced the levels even more in both species. So again, the glucocorticoid levels in the wolves is a lot lower than in the, wolf, uh, than in the dogs. And what's also interesting that we found is that the dogs were actually better at following the commands by the humans. So they were a bit more attentive and they were faster. How about aggression against humans? Well, not surprisingly, there are not so many studies out there. Um, but there are a few, and mainly from Budapest. So it's a group in Budapest who actually selected, uh, worked with, hum um, with wolves and dogs. They raised the animals a li little bit different. So they basically uh, took a wolf home, so like you would do it with a pet dog, and raised them at home, and compared them then with dogs that were raised in a similar manner. And uh, last year they published a study on physical restraint tests, so they held the puppy and then they brushed them or they put a muzzle on them and then they investigated how the animals reacted to that. And actually at the age of three months, the wolves were somewhat more aggressive towards the human than the dogs. However, this changed with development, so uh, at an older age, the dogs also started to bite the humans. So it was really more a developmental question. And this is important because the uh, wolves actually develop a bit faster than the dogs, so it could be pure developmental differences. However, they found differences when it was about defending a resource, where four out of the 16 wolves were a bit more aggressive than the dogs, so it, wouldn't, it wasn't so easy to take things away from them. They ran a similar study also with adult animals. However, they used pet dogs here, so not uh, the dogs that they raised in a similar manner as the wolves. Uh, and they used their socialized wolves. And here they actually found that if a human approached the animal in a threatening manner and tried to take something away from them, then some of the pet dogs reacted with aggression, but actually none of the wolves reacted with aggression. Uh, most of them were avoidant, so they went back and one was friendly. So this result doesn't really give us the impression that the wolves would be much more aggressive than the dogs. We ran a study at the Wolf Science Center where we actually also tried to defend the resource. And so we raised the animals, trying to avoid all kinds of conflicts with them, so they really don't know that situation. They are confronted with this situation the first time when they are six months old, when the person tells them, no, this is my meat, don't take it. And here you can see that. So she puts it on there. And you see that the wolf is not very much impressed. Um, but he's also not getting aggressive. He's, I mean, it would be easy for him. He's almost all full grown. It's a person he knows very well. And uh, instead of just biting her into her leg, he just, yes, sees who's faster in the end. Um, here you see the same experiment with a dog. These are dogs that are raised in the same way as the wolves. They have the same experiences, and you see a very, very different reaction. So basically, what we found is that um, more wolves took the meat than the dogs. And if the dogs also took the meat, so if both took the meat, they actually were fast, and the wolves were faster to take the meat than the dogs. So there are no clear differences in aggression. But it's very obvious that the wolves are much easier to inhibit and uh, they are much easier to command. So the dogs don't really care, uh, the wolves don't really care so much about that, whereas the dogs are really receptive to that. So what about aggression against conspecifics? Here, of course, we can look 
a bit better. So we have a resource defense here as well, where we have the wolves, there's a carcass in the enclosure, and we look at how the animals actually uh, try to negotiate to get close to the food. And you see that basically all of the wolves more or less feed there. There's a lot of communication there. So there's a lot of growling, the hackles go up, but they more or less feed together. They are all around and uh, the dominant animal is not very much impressed by the others growling at him or um, so they're all okay. In the dogs, it looks very differently again. So we have the dominant male here standing at the food and everybody else is wanting to get access but they don't dare to come closer. So in a graphic, it looks like that. So in the middle, you have the black point that the food resource and then in the dogs, you see that's mainly the dominant animal that's close to the food resource and everybody else stays back. Whereas in the wolves, it's actually uh, a good mix. We also ran studies uh, looking at the tolerance within the pack, so combining the different pack members. And uh, here again, we get a very similar pattern. So we have the wolves here feeding together. It's fast, there's growling, but they feed together. And the dogs, they also come there. Then the one animal growls and the other one goes off. There's still food there. So they, once there's clear communication, they are not daring to come close anymore. So basically what we found in these letter tests is that the frequency of aggression is the same in wolves and dogs, but the distribution is very differently. Whereas in the dogs, it's the dominant animals that are more mainly aggressive uh, and not the subordinates. In the wolves, it's more the subordinates who actually are aggressive, telling the dominant, I want to have access to the resource and I challenge you for it. And actually the dominant animals accept that. So this results in the dogs, actually the dominant animal feeding alone, whereas in the wolves, both the subordinates and the dominants are actually feeding together. So there's a lot of more food sharing going on than in the dogs. And actually these results are also collaborated by other uh, research groups that studied wolves and dogs in the past who actually found that dogs display a lot higher contact aggression than wolves. So they are more easy, they, they uh, escalate more likely into fights and it's usually the dominant ones and there's sometimes really severe aggression within packs. So if we sum this up, wolves are more fearful than dogs, yes, but they are also more interested and explorative of their environment. They have lower glucocorticoid levels than the dogs. Uh, there's no clear results concerning aggression towards humans, but there's also a few data, so we have to be careful there. But the dogs are much easier to inhibit and to command. In regard to aggression with conspecifics, uh, they are actually the dogs are more aggressive than the wolves, and they are less likely to share a resource. So what about cooperativeness? We ran studies using the string pulling paradigm where you have a table and then you have the food resource put on the, on the table and it's outside the enclosure. So actually to get access to the food resources, both animals or both partners have to pull at the two ends of the rope. Um, so here you see actually a human animal cooperation. So a dog cooperating with a human. So they come to the table and then uh, in half of the trials actually the human was, uh, we, we timed it in a way that the human was first at the apparatus so choosing the side that the animal didn't like uh, or liked more and in the other half of the trials the dog was actually there first or the okay. animal. Um, so we ran a one tray condition which you just saw in the video but we also ran a two tray condition where actually we had two apparatuses, the same apparatus was where the partners first had to coordinate to go to one apparatus and then to the next one. And what we found, basically in terms of success in the one tray condition, but also in the two apparatus condition, is that the animals were very successful. And the wolves were as, as successful as the dogs, so there was no difference. They did the same, they were the same successful, they served as many trials. But what the wolves did, they sometimes tried to steal the rope from the human. So 14 out of the 15 wolves tried at least once to take the rope away from the human partner, whereas only two of the dogs ever did that. Not aggressively though, but yes, I'll take the rope. 
Uh, and what we then looked at more closely is the behavior when they coordinated to go from the first to the second apparatus. Because here the human was instructed to wait for three seconds to see what the animal would be doing. And uh, then we measured what actually what was happening. And what you see here on that slide is that actually in the dogs, it's usually the human that leads, so the gray bar. And the dog sits there and looks what the human is going to do, whereas in the wolves, it's more likely that the wolf starts moving to the second apparatus. So he's leading the uh, corporation. And if you look at the trials where it's actually the human is leading, then it's also very clear that the wolves uh, are less likely to actually follow the human. So the gray here is the wolf, and you see in the first column that actually it's the dogs who really follow than the human as a human is leading. So very differently. They cooperate, but they do it differently. So how about interactions with conspecifics? So here you see two wolves acting together to solve this apparatus. And uh, so basically, in the end, we ran these studies with the conspecifics first. So what we had in the beginning are naive, um, were naive animals, so they didn't have any experience with this apparatus. And what we found here is that five out of seven animal, uh, diets, wolf diets, actually nevertheless managed to solve this task. They didn't know what to do, they didn't know how to pull the strings, but they managed to be successful, whereas none of the dog diets were ever successful. We then went back and used these animals that weren't successful and trained them to actually pull a rope. So we pulled them separately, individually, so they had uh, the rope really close together in the beginning, and they had to learn really to pull both ends of the rope at the same time. We moved them a little bit further apart until they were about 10 centimeters apart, and they really had to grab both to understand that they really need to pull both ropes. And then we moved the two ends really far apart again and uh, gave them a partner to solve the task together. And while this really boosted the effect for the wolves, so they were really successful now, the dogs were still like, hmm, not really, doesn't work for us. There was only one diet who actually succeeded in this. So the, wolves weren't, uh, the, the dogs weren't very successful in cooperating with, his, with each other. So, to sum this up, when socialized with humans, wolves and dogs can really nicely cooperate with them but the cooperation style differs, and this is important, because the dogs, they try to avoid the conflicts, and they are more differential in the way that they are waiting for the human to actually lead them forwards, to tell them what to do. Whereas the wolves are more in equal terms, right? I mean, I can also initiate things, we can work together, yes, but I have my own mind about this, and I can also make decisions. Uh, and if it's about conspecifics, actually, it's the wolves that are much more co cooperative than the dogs. So how, what about communication? Communication is also very important interaction, right, when we interact with our animals. And there's been a lot of ideas about how important co communication is. And actually, not surprisingly, one of the first uh, or the, one of the main paradigms on which most of the domestication hypotheses are actually based is a pointing study. So you have two containers, and one is baited and the other one is not, and then the human is standing in between trying to get the attention of the animal and then pointing to the one that's actually uh, baited. And then we see whether they actually follow uh, this communication. So it's a referential communication, and it's thought that this is a cooperative interaction. So the human is actually sharing information with the animal. And uh, several studies have found that at least as puppies, dogs are actually much better following these pointing gestures than wolves. It disappears a little bit as the animals get older, but in the beginning, it's really the uh, dogs that outperform the wolves. We also ran these studies at the Wolf Science Center, but we added two more um, conditions. One is the gazing condition uh, of the human and also gazing condition of a conspecific. So a dog actually who was there during the hand raising of the animals and had a really good relationship with our subjects. And this is important because this hand 
movement, of course, is something very human. So normally, dogs or wolves, they would communicate by gazing, right? And there's no reason why we would expect that if it's really about understanding the communication of the human, the animals should uh, not understand the, the gazing. Here you see how it looks like with a dog gazing for a wolf. So the dogs were trained, of course, nicely, and as I said, they had very close relationships with the wolves and also with our uh, dogs at the center. So what we found, and we were a bit surprised about that, is that the wolves actually do quite well with uh, conspecific gaze, so they follow it nicely. Uh, they're not very good with the human gaze or the distal pointing at the age of three months. But the dogs, they cannot do the gazing. They do very well with the pointing, but they can't do the gazing. And this is really surprising because if they really understand the human communication, at least they should have reacted to the human gaze. Maybe not to the conspecific, but at least to the human gaze. And uh, so the idea here is maybe this Pointing is sure is not so much about sharing information, but rather you go there. I tell you where to go. And uh, this is, of course, then not about sharing information, but it's about following commands. And we have just seen that wolves might not be the best in that regard. Another study that we did really to understand communication a little bit better is how can the animals communicate with a human? So not reading the communication by humans, but can they actually use a human to communicate to them? And here we had a study where we trained the animals on two humans who had different roles. One of them went to a bucket, picked up some food, and shared it with the animal. And the second partner actually came, uh, showed the food, and then ate it himself. So it was a competitor. And then we tested them in a, a showing experiment where we had three buckets hang, uh, hang up in the testing uh, room. The animals knew that if there was food, they could show it to the experiment or to the person to get the food. And uh, in the test then, there was first there was only the animal present and a hider who then hid the food, showed the animal in, what, in which one of the three containers the food was actually hidden and then the hider left the room, and one of the two partners came back in, so the competitive or the cooperative partner. And what we found is actually that uh, both the wolves and the dogs clearly showed the partners where the food was hidden, and they did it more to the cooperative partner than the competitive one. And actually the wolves were very much successful there, though this might have been because they are a bit more active than the dogs. So to sum this up, Wolves and dogs differ in following pointing, at least when they are puppies, but it's really a bit unclear what is the, is it really about cooperativeness or is it more about this being differential and following the commands of the human. And uh, both wolves and dogs nicely communicate with humans to get access to a resource. So they can use the human partner to actually get their way. So what does that mean for our uh, emotional reactivity hypothesis? Well, fear, yes. Wolves are more afraid than dogs. But um, in terms of aggression and also cooperation, it's more difficult. And also with the glucocorticoid levels, there's no support really that the wolves would have higher, uh, no, yes, higher glucocorticoid levels than the dogs. So, well, not really, right? So, one can also look at this from a different way. So one can look at it from the, from the way of bonding with each other, right? So in a few years ago, the hypersociability hypothesis was uh, put forward. And here, it's, yes, maybe they're a bit more or less afraid, so dogs are a bit less afraid of the humans, but it's maybe mainly because they are more social. So they want to approach the human, they are more social. And that really predicts that the dogs seek social company more often than wolves. And here the idea is that this is actually mediated by oxytocin concentration. So that there's been a lot of studies around showing that actually bonding or building up a relationship increases the oxytocin levels in these animals. 
And there's been a study in 2015 by Nagasawa. Uh, they tested wolves that were kept in enclosures and pet dogs and looked at the oxytocin levels after an interaction with a human, after they actually got in eye contact with them. And what they found here is that in at least a subset of the dogs, there was an increase in oxytocin levels after they looked at the human for a long time, whereas in the wolves they didn't find an increase. However, this study is really problematic because uh, of the pet dogs and the wolves. The wolves were kept in enclosures, they were hand-raised, but basically they uh, before they started the study, just before they went into to get the wolves out of the enclosure. And if you know something about wolf behavior, you know that the wolves will be really happy to see the hand raiser. They are getting very excited, they are very happy, and they want to interact with them. And most likely, this explains why there is such a high oxytocin level already at the animals at the beginning of the experiment. So maybe they were already at the top levels and they couldn't even go higher after the interaction with the human. So it's problematic. So we really wanted to see uh, what happens if you control properly for these uh, problems. So we ran two studies on sociability at the Wolf Science Center. And the worst, first one was about preference for uh, food versus a cuddle. So basically, we had a pretest where we had, uh, again, two humans. One would come into the enclosure and offer a cuddle to the animals, so they could come and be cuddled, really nice. And the other one would come and give them food rewards. And so they learned the two rows. And what we found here is actually that the dogs spent a lot of more time being cuddled than the wolves. The wolves instead went off to explore the test enclosure a little bit. And then we had a test phase where they could actually choose between the cuddler and the person providing food, and while the, wolf, uh, while the dogs actually choose more often than the wolves, so the wolves just didn't make the choice very often, um, if they made the choice, there was no preference, uh, neither on the wolves nor on the dogs. So they didn't have a clear preference for the social interaction compared to the um, food provider. And then we ran a second study uh, just recently where we, this was much closer to the original study by Nagasawa and colleagues, where we had uh, two social conditions, basically, one with a bonded person, so a hand raiser, and one with a familiar person. Uh, it was a researcher that the animals knew, but they didn't have a special relationship with them. And we ran, ran the studies through the fence, just to make sure with a familiar person that the animals have a choice what to do. And, uh, so they first had a training interaction where they had to follow a few commands and then they could be cuddled and they could decide how much time they would actually spend close to the person. And on top of our uh, animals at the Wolf Science Center, we also tested pet dogs here just to make sure that socialization doesn't play a role. And what we found in terms of body contact is that animals really spent uh, more time with a hand raiser than with a bonded person but there was actually no difference between wolves and dogs. However, what you can see on the graph, there was a huge group level variability uh, difference between the two species. So in the wolves, there were actually some animals that never interacted with a familiar uh, person. They just went away. Whereas others actually spent the whole time with a familiar person. So you have a huge variability. In the pet dogs, there was no difference between the two conditions, so they were uh, with both of them. And then we really looked at the behavior because we were really interested in what's going on there, and we looked at self-directed behavior, so that slip slicking and uh, uh, so some, some of these behaviors very often associated with stress and uh, with appeasement behavior. And what we found here, interestingly, that the dogs showed a lot more of these behaviors than the wolves. So the rate was 1.4, whereas in the wolves it was 0 0.5. And what you see here in the dogs, actually they showed much more of these self-directed behaviors if they were together with a familiar person. So in the end, these uh, behaviors were correlated uh, positively with body contact. So the more you were in body contact, the more of these uh, self-directed behaviors you showed, and it was mediated by the relationship strengths. 
And this was only true for the wolf science and the animals, not the pet dogs. How about the hormone levels? So this was really a surprise for us because the oxytocin levels didn't go up for the wolf and dogs at the Wolf Science Center at all, neither for the bonded human nor with the familiar human. And this was not a problem with analysis because in our control condition where we had food there, it did go up. So food actually brought about a change in uh, oxytocin levels. But interestingly here in the pet dogs, we did see the effect of uh, these hormone levels. So they went up after they interacted with their owner. So again, we have to be very careful because the experience actually with humans really influences the physiological uh, correlates. So this is important to keep in mind when we do this comparison and also it may, might explain prior studies or previous studies. How about basal activity of oxytocin? Here again, Gwen collected urine uh, to measure that, and we found that dogs had marginally large, uh, higher oxytocin levels than the wolves. However, again, if you look at the graph, what you see, it's mainly the male dogs who have the high oxytocin levels. It's not the female animals. They have about the same. So maybe this is more a sex effect than actually effect of the uh, interaction with the human. So, if you sum this up, there are, yes, there are differences in sociability, but they are subtle and they're mediated by, social, um, by, by the relationship strengths. So it's really uh, not a huge difference. And uh, if you have a good familiar par or, or good bonding partner, you actually, there's not a huge difference anymore between wolves and dogs. So the socialization actually predicts wolves and dogs' sociability and also the physiological correlates. So if we come back to our hypersociability hypothesis then, well, yes, somewhat. So it's clear that it's easier, or that, that dogs are more social, especially towards people that they don't know so well. But it doesn't really explain all of these differences that we see. So coming back to the domestication process and our two questions, let's recap the wolves. They cooperate and socialize nicely with humans if they are socialized, and they are tolerant and very cooperative with conspecifics. So this is actually very much in line with their social ecology. Wolves form uh, st stable packs, they have a family structure, and they cooperate in raising the young and defending their territory and during hunting. So this led us to uh, suggest the canine uh, cooperation hypothesis, namely that wolves are tolerant and cooperative with each other, and that this wolf-wolf cooperation might have really been the basis for the evolution of the dog-human cooperation. And what's definitely true, that's in, in, um, in accordance with belief and also here, that uh, yes, it's easier to socialize dogs than wolves. However, what we also saw in this talk is that dog-dog and dog-human cooperation uh, is not the same to wolf-wolf and wolf-human cooperation, so there are differences. So what about the dogs? They cooperate and socialize with humans by following and accepting human leaderships. The oxytocin levels are dependent on life experiences. And with conspecific, and conspecific they are actually not tolerant and they are not very cooperative. And the subordinates do not really challenge the dominant animals, and they have higher glucocorticoid levels. And actually, this can be very nicely explained by the social ecology, at least the behavior with conspecifics, because dogs are actually scavengers that eat human refuse. So this, uh, they are, don't really engage in cooperative hunting. They can defend their resources because they are small and distributed. It's not big chunks, but it's much better to actually be aggressive about them and defend them against others. Um, and this also led to changes in the social system because they are not cooperative breeders anymore. They don't need each other to raise the young. The female can put her den really close to the rubbish dump and just go out a few meters to get the food and go back. So it's really uh, a different social system. And so this might explain the low tolerance and cooperation. And we formulated the social ecology hypothesis about these changes 
that actually compared to the wolves, the dog social ecology differs, and this really relaxes the selection on uh, intraspecific communication and cooperation, so that explains why they are not so cooperative and communicative anymore. But why do they succeed with humans in cooperative interactions? Well, maybe because there was selection for differential temperament. So maybe we selected the dogs really to follow us, to accept our commands, to avoid conflicts so that we can much easier um, lead them and work with them. And this might actually also explain the sociability, because if you think back on it, uh, so the dogs weren't very comfortable being around the familiar person. Uh, so they had all these uh, stress signals. So maybe they just try to fulfill the expectation that we have and are much better with that. So if you love me, you obey me. And this really allows for safe coexistence of humans and dogs. So coming back to our domestication process, yes, there was human selection for specific traits, but what we shouldn't forget is that there's also natural and, uh, natural and sexual selection pressures that probably influence the behavior of these animals. And so what I'd like you to take home is that dog domestication is not a simple process, but a combination of natural and artificial selection pressures that shouldn't be forgotten in all these discussions that are out there. And with that, I would like to thank my audience all around the world and also acknowledge a lot of people who actually helped with all these studies. So there were a lot of researchers involved in this study. There were a lot of PhD studies, students involved in that, and lots of master and intern students. We have several collaborators and a lot of different funding agencies that supported us in all these different studies. Thank you very much. Test, test. Thank you very much, Frederica, for a fantastic and uh, pretty provocative talk. That really goes against a lot of the received wisdom about dogs and wolves. So we've got about 15 minutes for questions, and I'm going to try and go back and forth between, we've got some questions online, which I can see, um, but we'll start with a question from the audience, and I'm going to run around playing uh, talk show host, so please wait till I, yes. Uh, thanks for the good talk. Uh, I'm really interested in the differences in the glucocorticoid levels. Could you say some more about that? Do you have anything more to say about it? Um, they are lower in the dogs. Uh, they are lower in the wolves than the dogs. I mean, we have done that now with uh, several studies, so not just, uh, as I said, I mean, we, I showed two studies. There's another study, and we find the same thing uh, over and over again. And uh, yes, I mean, it makes sense in the light that on the free-ranging dogs actually probably defend their food. But uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, no, well, I, don't, I don't know what else to say to that. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I also have a follow-up question on the glucocorticoids. So glucocorticoids are changing strongly over the course of the day. And obviously this depends on the timing phenotype that these animals have. My question is just naively not being from the field. I was wondering, the wolves, I imagine them more being active during the night and the dogs being more active during the day. Is this like this, are there different, or more generally asked, are there differences in their chronobiological structure and could this explain the, uh, the differences in the glucocorticoids? And if you were normalizing against this, basically you would come up with a different outcome. Uh, we have tried to control for all these th things, of course, and uh, at least our wolves at the Wolf Science Center, they really adapt to our schedule. So they are, yes, and the, and the free-ranging wolves are probably more active during the uh, dusk and dawn. Not so much in the night, but dusk and dawn. Uh, but our wolves really adapted already. I mean, it still is possible, of course, that, that there might be a difference there. But 
we haven't really found a, yeah, a clear cut uh, difference. And we controlled for the timing with all our analysis, and we actually did <coughs> both for the quality, glucocorticoid levels as well as for the oxytocin levels. Gwen really did a lot of um, validation studies, so especially for the oxytocin, which has been a problem all over. We ran, really, we did it very properly this time, and first ran all the validation studies on the collection of these uh, the, the urine, the saliva, so we have done the background work properly in these studies. So I'm going to take a question from the online, from Laura Kelly, who says, my understanding is that dominance in dogs is fluid and context dependent rather than specific dogs always being dominant over the others. Is that true in your observed dog pack's social structure? Um, in most... In most situations, it's, it's a dominant dog that we have in there. So, I mean, they are living together, so it's not like pet dogs, but this is, of course, true. I mean, they meet different dogs, and then they can be dominant or subdominant, but these animals are living together. And uh, it's actually, it depends a little bit on the context, but actually not that much. Okay. Hi, thanks for a great talk. I wanted to ask you, whether you could say a little bit more about differences in cognition. So as far as I understand, the differences in behavior that you see get explained in terms of you know, different uh, dispositions to cooperate in terms of motivational factors. But what about differences in, in cognitive abilities? What would you say about you know, differences between the minds of, of dogs and wolves? Uh, yes, so I mean, they, in the end, the cooperation that we see in our wolves and dogs, there's no difference in the cognitive abilities. So they can do it very nicely with the human. They can wait for the human. They can even recruit a human partner. So they really understand uh, the role to, the, to a certain degree of the partner. Uh, and so there, I don't think it's really the difference. The, the reason why the dogs do not cooperate with each other is because uh, they don't want to be so close to each other and they don't want to share their resource. And this becomes very clear because after we ran the studies with conspecifics and then with the humans, so they had a lot of experience how this whole thing works. We put the dogs back together with their original partners or partners from the pack to see if they could use what they learned now and they didn't cooperate again. So it's really, yes, uh, cognitively I don't think there's a difference in the cooperation and coordination, it's more at the emotional level that they make the difference because what we also see in post-social, so when we test post-sociality in these animals, the wolves are actually post-social towards a partner, the dogs are not. So it's really, um, yeah, I don't know how much the dogs then understand about how important it might be to, to interact with your partner and be friendly to them, but um, it's, I think it's more at the emotional level that the difference is. It's different if you think about physical cognition. So here the wolves seem to be a bit better in some aspects. But some things we are just trying to uh, figure out at the moment in a project. Okay, I've got another one from online, from Greg Trafton. Um, with the interaction studies with people, how did you deal with or control for the nonverbal study signals that may have occurred by the humans across species, a la Clever Hunt's effect? Well, that's a very good question, and actually we just got a project to look at that <laughs> uh, in more, more detail. I mean, our, so the, the study with, uh, through the fence, actually these are people that interact with the wolves and the dogs on a daily level, and they actually have very close relationships with both. So these are really, the hand raisers they have very close relationships with the animals, uh, with the wolves, dogs, I don't think there's a difference, and we actually ran a study now that uh, we are analyzing at the moment, and there doesn't seem to be a difference in the attitude towards these animals from the hand raisers. Uh, the familiar people, they are on the safe side of the fence, so I don't think that it really influences their, them very much. And these are researchers as well, so they want to study both. And uh, they have a lot of close interactions with these animals, so I don't think it's a huge problem. But of course, there might be something there, but we are going to try to 
uh, look at that more closely. So basically, you control for them by making sure that they're the same magnitude for the dogs and the wolves. Yeah. Okay, well, here's one uh, coming from our future COGSI president, Kenny Smith, um, and you're probably waiting for this one. Can you tell us what you think the implications of your work are for human evolution and the self-domestication hypothesis? Is the message that understanding the selection pressures arising from the social environment depend on the fine details of that environment rather than being general effects of domestication, selection for increased cooperation, et cetera? Yeah, That's a so, big question. <laughs> so actually the idea out there at the moment is that the, safe uh, that the dog wolf model is a very good model for the safe domestication of humans, right? But Seeing the data now, we don't believe in that. I think actually the wolves might be the better model because they are the ones that are cooperative. They are the ones that are monogamous. They are the ones that are the cooperative breeder. So everything that the human is and that we move to from our ancestors to becoming humans. And in the, in the wolf-dog comparison, actually the, it goes in the opposite direction, right? So we have the very cooperative wolf that then becomes less cooperative, not a cooperative breeder anymore. And uh, so I don't think the wolf-dog model is very good to use for this self-domestication idea. And also it really illustrates that you have to look at the, uh, at the animal in the environment. So you cannot take out the animal out of the niche that they were adapted to. <coughs> And this is, I think, what our research shows also now what we do with the free-ranging dogs. You have to see it as a big thing. So a lot of people have seen dogs as this very special animal that are removed from all the natural and sexual selection pressures, and this is wrong. 70 to 80% of the dogs worldwide are free-ranging dogs. They are not our pet dogs. Our pet dogs are the exception, and these are purebred dogs. So it really, to understand domestication, I think you have to see the wider view, and uh, I don't know so much about the human self-domestication, but I think also there you have to see the, the whole thing. You cannot just look at specific things, and the dog-wolf model is definitely not a good one. Hmm. So if self-domestication is right in humans, don't use dogs to stop No. It. Okay. It doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna, I think we're running out of time, but I'll take, the, there's a couple questions about size, and I was thinking the same thing myself, looking at the size differences among the dogs versus the wolves. So, um, kind of two questions in one, are the dogs more varied in size within the species? Assuming the bigger dog tends to be dominant and the structure is more hierarchical uh, or unequal because of the size variability, so that's part one, within them, and then also, are. Be, are the wolves generally larger than the dogs in this study? I think so. Could this explain why the dogs are more deferential to humans? Uh, so yes, we, um, of course there's a bigger size differentiation in the, in the dogs in, in, in general, but actually it's not that big with our animals. So we have looked uh, at the sizes of the heads, for example, and I was surprised Actually, in the end, uh, how little uh, how small the difference is. So it's not a huge difference. It is a difference, but we have a lot of bigger dogs because they are living outside the whole year round. <coughs> and uh, within the pack structure, actually, the, the wolves are also, they have a very clear-cut structure. So it's not that, that they are, um, that the dominant uh, characteristics are different than the dogs. It's just in the end what comes out is that the dogs, if it's about resources, uh, resources, they seem to be more, okay, this is mine, whereas the wolves are more willing to share. But there's no question about who's dominant in the wolves either. It's a very, very clear cut structure, and if at all, it's even clearer in the wolves than it's in the dogs. So you have a very clear linear hierarchy in our packs, which is probably due to the fact also that these are not natural packs, right? We, we put them together. Uh, so, but we, could, we, we cannot find any difference in the, or the steepness or the counter-aggression. It's really just where we see the differences are when it's about resources and when it's about defending these resources or sharing resources on the matter. Hmm. So the chances of these effects coming from body size differences are I doubt it, yeah. pretty minimal. Okay, well, I think that's it. We're out of time, so I hope everyone will join me in thanking Frederica Ranga for a great opening keynote. <laughs>